Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to the annual university address. It feels like a nice, brisk fall day out there, so I hope you appreciate that. My name is Michael Wright. I'm the Vice President for Communications and the Chief of Staff, and it is my honor to MC today. Before we begin, please, if you wouldn't mind silencing your cell phones. Now, if you want to use your cell phones and take pictures, we're all cool with that. Take them, tweet them, Facebook them, do whatever you want. Uh, that's all good. Today's format's real simple. The President's going to be introduced, and I'll introduce the introducer in a moment, and then he'll speak. There won't be any Q&A afterwards. Following this event, there's an ice cream social at McGregor. Now, the ice cream social was planned when it was 90 degrees outside, so we didn't anticipate this sort of weather, but we should, being in Michigan, but it'll be in McGregor Conference Center, so please help yourself to the ice cream social. One other note before we begin. If you're looking for something great to do this weekend, we have Warrior Football, 6 p.m., Tom Adams Field against Carson Newman. Tailgating starts at 3 p.m., so you're, of course, welcome to come for tailgating as well. Uh, with the President's focus on students being so strong, we thought we would do again what we did in the last address, which is to bring a student out to introduce the President. And the student happens to be a President, so we'll have a the president of the Student Senate introducing the president today. Naomi Shangle is a junior, majoring in public relations. She is from Grand Rapids, Michigan. She's, as I said, the president of the Student Senate, but she's, she does other things as well. She's an RA in the Towers, Auditor or the Tow Towers Auditorium, the Towers Hall, and she also does theater, and she did theater with the Hillbury over the summer. And if you know anything about public relations, you know how theater and public relations can be very closely related at times. So anyway, let's welcome the President of the Student Senate, Naomi Shangle. <laughs> That's another little tradition that we have. It started. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. M. Roy Wilson, the 12th President of Wayne State University. Prior to joining Wayne State University last August, President Wilson served as Deputy Director for Strategic and Scientific Planning and Program Coordination at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities of the National Institute of Health. Wow, that's a lot to say. His research has focused on glaucoma and blindness in the populations from the Caribbean and West Africa for 14 consecutive years. He was selected for the list of best doctors in America by Best Doctors, Inc. President Wilson received his undergraduate degree from Allegheny College and an MS in Epidemiology from the University of California in Los Angeles, and his MD from Harvard Medical School. President Wilson has often been quoted saying here at Wayne State that students are our top priority. Over the past year, I've come to realize that this isn't just something that President Wilson says, it's something that he truly believes. It's not unusual to see President Wilson around with students, hanging out in the cafeteria, eating lunch, passing out ice cream during move-in, or even just listening to their complaints. President Wilson truly believes that we are here for the students. And as a student, I would like to thank you for your service to us. And it has been an honor to work with you this past year. And I would like to thank you and say I'm excited to continue to work with you next year. Ladies and gentlemen, President Wilson. Thank you, Naomi. I'm glad you took that away, otherwise I'd have been tempted to uh, <laughs> do that, and I probably would have broken my uh, neck doing that. All right, good morning, everybody. Morning. I just want to, uh, first of all, thank all of you for being here. I want to acknowledge the presence of, of our chair of the Board of Governors, Debbie Dingell, who's there in the back. Thank you. I'd like to also acknowledge another special guest who's joined us today. This man is a Wayne State alumnus who we are happy to come on campus from time to time. He was awarded an honorary Dr. Humane Letters degree at our 2013 commencement ceremony. Most importantly, he exemplifies many of the qualities of Wayne State students and alumni, talent, creativity, hard work, persistence, and success. And if you watch the Oscar-winning documentary, 
searching for Sugar Man. This man needs no introduction. Please give a warm welcome to Rodriguez. So I'm just really thrilled that the fall semester has started. There seems to be a vibrancy around campus, which may have been present last year, but I just don't remember quite as vibrant. After a year here, I feel that I've become very familiar with Wayne State, with Detroit, and with Michigan. Some of you know that I'm an avid cyclist, and Jacqueline and I have had the opportunity to explore much of Michigan this summer through cycling. Almost every weekend this summer, if we did not have out-of-town commitments, we would participate in a sponsored ride somewhere in Michigan and had an opportunity to see parts of Michigan which we may not otherwise have visited. Grand Haven, Grand Rapids, St. Clair, Chelsea, Schwartz Creek, parts of Canada, and yes, of course, even parts of Detroit. There's no better way of understanding the state than visiting different parts of the state in interacting with people of all ages, different socioeconomic status, different perspectives, people with whom you are simply another cyclist and not president of Wayne State. Not only is it a lot of fun, but it's also a great learning experience and I always come away with a different perspective, an enhanced perspective of the region. And there's no better way of understanding a city than living right in the middle of the city and of understanding a university than living on campus. And Jacqueline and I have enjoyed being a part of campus and part of our midtown neighborhood. Paris has the Eiffel Tower. London has Big Ben. New York, the Statue of Liberty. And San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. But no structure or symbol, not even the Great Wall of China, better personifies the spirit and soul of an entire country than does Mount Fuji in Japan. As many of you know, Japan is my birthplace, so it was of special, I would say even spiritual significance for me to be able to climb to the summit of Mount Fuji to experience the sunrise there this summer. Jacqueline and my daughter Presley joined me, though I think they would probably describe the arduous climb in the dark of night and the entire experience in somewhat different terms. <laughs> in fact, just to show you that we all made it to the summit in time for sunrise, here we are, uh, Jacqueline, my daughter, Presley, and, and me. Now, I mention this because as Mount Fuji symbolizes the spirit and soul of Japan, I've been pondering a lot about the spirit and soul of Wayne State University. And just think about that a moment, and I'll come back to it later. But since this is a university address, I should spend a few moments discussing where I think we are with regard to our vision of being among the preeminent public urban research universities of the nation and share a few thoughts on what I think needs to be done to achieving that vision. I remain excited and optimistic, but also, I do think we are at a tipping point. And if you object to that expression because it's so overused, think of it as a watershed moment instead. Broadly defined as a critical dividing line or change of course, a transition, whether for the positive or the negative. So let's look at a few specific areas. One, enrollment. Our Board of Governors has appropriately been laser focused on our enrollment. On the positive side, our first time freshman enrollment is up 1.4% and transfer students up 2% from last year. Our international enrollment is also up and is growing. In total, we welcomed 7,096 new students to campus this fall, an increase of 8% over last fall. But we experienced a decrease in overall enrollment as a result of the decrease in our continuing student numbers. Now, how can that be? There are a number of reasons. Part of it is a consequence of having lower numbers of incoming freshmen and graduate students several years ago. There's not much we can do about that at this point. 
But there are also financial, family, work, and academic reasons. And we can help them with some of these issues. To break down barriers, to facilitate their success, to help them graduate. Michigan is well served by its 15 public universities. But the demographics of the state are changing. And the projected numbers of college-age kids is going to be smaller. And of this smaller number, those who are college ready will have many options for higher education. That means we've got to convince prospective students that Wayne State is where they should pursue their education rather than somewhere else. Once here, we've got to make sure they have positive experiences, feel supported, and desire to stay here to complete their education. In order to do that, we must deliver a better product and better services at a better value. This is a watershed moment for us. Have we turned the corner on declining enrollments, or are there improved numbers, at least in relation to the first time freshmen, a temporary blip in an otherwise downward spiral? I believe we have turned the corner, and I assure you that the Board of Regents, Board of Governors, in my administration will continue to work diligently to sustain an upward trajectory. But each and every one of you also matter and can influence whether or not students preferentially select Wayne State to pursue their college education and decide to persist on through graduation at Wayne State. In truth, we are going to lose a certain segment of the prospective student population to the University of Michigan and even Michigan State. They're both outstanding institutions and I have great respect for the role each play in higher education locally and nationally. But those students represent a very small group. Through outstanding teaching, an innovative curriculum, internship and research opportunities that not all universities can offer, a campus that is clean, safe, and attractive, and brimming with vibrancy, let's commit, let's all of us commit to making Wayne State the university of choice for the large remaining segment of the prospective student population. Second, student success. We have an opportunity to make huge gains in this area. Over the past three years, 38 new academic advisors have been hired and other resources have been allocated. Preliminary data on retention and graduation trends are encouraging. For 2014, we expect that our six-year graduation rate for first-time college students will have increased seven percentage points over the past three years. We expect this... We expect this rate to be 33%, up from 26% in 2011. Our five-year graduation rate is expected to have increased nearly four percentage points over the past three years. Also, we expect that our retention into the third year and into the fourth year will have increased by more than seven percentage points each since 2011. We are thus well positioned to continue to improve our six-year graduation rates over the next few years. But there are significant challenges. One of the major barriers to students being able to persist and complete their degree is the financial distress many of them experience. We have some limited resources to assist such students in financial need to succeed, most notably the generous scholarship program of Bill Berman called Crossing the Finish Line, and the HIGH program, Helping Individuals Go Higher program that Jacqueline has initiated. Unfortunately, the need is great, much greater than I had anticipated, and the available resources are overwhelmed by the need. Perhaps the most joyful moment that both Jacqueline and I have experienced at Wayne State was at commencement this past May in seeing several students cross a stage that would not have done so 
had it not been for some financial assistance provided them. The moment of truth came for me and for Jacqueline when a certain student came to our attention last fall. It's about this time. It was the first student we helped. So let me tell your story. So her name is Kari. She doesn't mind, you know, being named specifically. A great student, a 3.6 grade point average, a senior, progressing well, kinesiology major, needed to take a um, internship at Henry Ford Hospital in the winter semester in order to graduate. In order to take that internship, there was a course that she needed, a prerequisite course. Unfortunately, that course was not offered in the fall semester, so she took it in the summer. In the fall, she now had a bill for both the fall semester and the summer semester, which was not paid for by some financial aid, and registration was holding up her registration for the winter semester until she put her balance of, in uh, total uh, balance uh, paid up front. That was just a little over $1,000 or so. So the sequence again is that she needed her internship, needed to take a course, took the course in the summer because it wasn't offered in the fall, and went into some financial difficulties because financial aid doesn't provide scholarships in the fall, in the, in the summer. We were able to help her out, and she was able to cross the stage this past May. Now, this story is illustrative in two ways. First, given our mission of access and opportunity for students of all socioeconomic profiles and life circumstances, student success, as measured by the six-year graduation rate, will continue to be more of a challenge for Wayne State than for almost all of our peer group of national universities with very high research activity. The sad truth is that the students we are able to help just represent the tip of the proverbial iceberg. But the second issue is that students who do everything right, take the courses they're supposed to take, get good grades, are motivated to finish, should have an expectation to graduate on time. Now, I don't know the specifics of why the course she needed wasn't offered in the fall semester. But I do know that every student who matriculates at our university and does everything they're supposed to do should be provided a clear pathway to graduate in four years. That's our responsibility. We owe our students that and we owe the parents of our students that also. <laughs> now looking into the future, both enrollment and student success have more impact on our funding than any other factors, except tuition increases, which of course we must moderate. Now nationally, consideration will likely be given to not penalizing universities that accept and educate at-risk, typically low-income students, and President Obama's proposed university ranking system. And incidentally, that ranking system will determine how much universities get in terms of federal financial aid. Now, although we will make the argument to do the same at the state level, I'm not optimistic that the state metric on six-year graduation rate is going to change appreciably. The reality is that how we perform over the coming years in improving student success will significantly impact our budget. Yet despite the challenges, there is good reason for optimism. I mentioned the earlier positive trends. But several universities with similar student profiles to ours have experienced substantial gains in their six-year graduation rates over five to eight year time frame. We're learning from these universities. And we have a devoted partner in the Kresge Foundation. A generous grant from the foundation is allowing us to implement many of the strategies used by these successful universities. 
And I'd like to publicly thank the Kresge Foundation for this very important support. <laughs> Third is research. Our research has experienced a downward trajectory over the past decade, our research funding. In fact, some of you may have seen the NPR Health News article just a couple of days ago in which Wayne State was mentioned, along with nine others, as institutions that have experienced notable declines in NIH funding over the past decade. However, so far, year to date, we are noting an increase in federal research funding, and we do have an opportunity to change the trajectory of the past decade with our new research building. Now, I purposely didn't refer to the building as MBRB because after much consultation and discussion, our Vice President for Research has proposed a new name for this building, the Integrative Biosciences Center, or iBio. And so far, it's getting a very good reception. But new facilities alone will not be the answer. Too little attention has been paid to the research enterprise over many years, and we are barely hanging on to our status as a major national research university. Some of our existing research spaces, both wet and dry lab space, are not in acceptable condition. Over this past year, we put a dent in addressing this problem in the College of Engineering, where several laboratories are being renovated, we will need even more extensive upgrades in the Scott Building of the School of Medicine. If the Integrative Biosciences Center simply becomes replacement for currently non-functional or undesirable research space, our research enterprise will not advance. Rather, we must have new and more research, more large center grant type research, and more program programmatic research that directly impacts the urban health disparity populations that we serve. We have very capable faculty, and we must provide them the environment and the resources to be maximally productive. As importantly, we must examine longstanding policies and practices that do not optimally incentivize research, particularly theme-based and programmatic research. A faculty group is currently reviewing such policies and practices, and recommendations for change will be forthcoming soon. Now, make no mistake about it, we have significant challenges, not the least of which is limited funds to recruit additional investigators. Research thus represents a watershed moment for us. But I am confident that we have the right leadership in place that we have begun to address our infrastructure needs and that we will ultimately implement policies and practices to advance our research objectives. It won't be easy, but I am confident that our trajectory in research will be upward. Finally, I'm going to touch on a topic that many of you might wonder and say, well, why is that a watershed? and that is the humanities and art. Now, this is not solely a Wayne State issue, but rather a state and national issue. Both the nation and the state of Michigan, as well as many other states, are focused on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math. And I understand that focus. The nation needs more graduates in the STEM disciplines in order to maintain our global leadership position in science and technology. For states such as Michigan, graduating more students in the STEM disciplines is a strategic necessity for fulfilling workforce demands and for economic development. In fact, in Michigan, the performance metrics upon which state funding for higher education is based includes number of degrees conferred in the STEM disciplines. The humanities and arts are becoming an afterthought. Even the President of the United States made comments that were denigrating to art history majors in his last State of the Union speech. I believe that to be short-sighted. 
Now, I'm often asked why, as a medical scientist and researcher, I am such an advocate for the humanities and arts. So I'll share a personal story with you that might shed some light on this perspective. It's not a story that I, I tell very often. I didn't particularly like my undergraduate experience, at least the first few years of it. The reason had nothing to do with academics or the faculty, many of whom I developed very close relationships with, but everything to do with the social climate. I went to a school with just 1,800 students. Less than 40 were minorities. I remember one incident that really was the, the, the moment of truth for me. And this was at Halloween when a uh, uh, black girl student, a fellow colleague, came to me crying because she was so offended that one of the fraternities, uh, the Fijis, was dragging um, another uh, fraternity brother with his face painted black on a chain. And she was very offended. So I was on my way to basketball practice, and so I, um, uh, two of my basketball buddies who was in this fraternity, and I went to them and I told them the story and I, and I expected a different response than what I got. The response I got was, well, it's Halloween, isn't it? And I decided then that that wasn't the environment that, that I could stay in. So this was uh, sophomore year. So that plus other things made me decide to leave college early. So I applied to medical school. And I think I applied to three, but I'm not sure. I just remember three interviews. One interview, University of Maryland, I decided to drop that one because the person who interviewed me bred dogs. That was his uh, uh, hobby. And he was talking about minorities and a breeding context and was comparing me to his well-bred hunting dogs. So I decided I was going to drop University of Maryland. Only reason why I picked it was because of uh, my home. I lived in Maryland. I didn't get into uh, Yale, but inexplicably, okay, now this is after my second year, inexplicably, Harvard didn't reject me. They put me on a waiting list with a very nice letter that said, we'd love for you to come, but we think you should finish your undergraduate degree first, that you will be a better doctor if you finish your undergraduate degree. So, you know, I pretty much knew I was in. And if you know anything about medicine and pre-med, you know that it's a very competitive um, pre-med curriculum, and usually in your junior year is when the students are trying to do their best to beat each other, to take the hardest science courses, the most advanced science courses, to differentiate themselves from other students. Well, I never took another science course. Okay. Having gotten assurance that I was going to be in medical school, the only courses I took from then on was in the humanities arts. I developed a love of mythology, of philosophy, of art and music. And my life has been forever enriched by experiencing and understanding these topics. So a miserable college experience was transformed into one that I would now consider to be among the very most rewarding my entire life. So that's my story. <laughs> so I believe firmly that leading institutions of higher education in Wayne State specifically must reaffirm its commitment to the humanities and arts. Given our limited resources, 
How we res respond to the assault on the humanities and arts will be a watershed moment. How we respond will determine whether or not we are recognized as a great university or one that is merely pedestrian. Our commitment will likely be tested. When the time comes, though, I hope you would take the example of Detroit and the Detroit Institute of Art, rise to the challenge, and declare definitively the value of the arts to our institution and to higher education more broadly. So, where do I think we are in our vision to be one of the preeminent public urban research universities of the country? It's aspirational, but achievable. What happens over the next, perhaps, two, three years will determine the direction of our trajectory. But I believe to my core that it will be a positive one. But we can't just sit back. We must actively influence that trajectory. Now, there are two major activities or initiatives that will have a profound influence on the future of Wayne State, the strategic plan and the capital campaign. And we need your participation in both. Strategic plans are often overrated. I made a decision when I first arrived that we would not undertake a strategic plan during my initial year. There were obvious areas that needed immediate focus, and frankly, we didn't need a strategic plan to tell us what those were. We've dealt with, or in the process of dealing with, the low-hanging fruit. Now we're in a different story, a different place. The decisions on where we place limited resources are more difficult, and we need a well-worked-out game plan. We began the strategic planning process in the spring, and it continues today. At my direction and with the assistance of the Barthwell Group, we have sought input from across the campus and the community. Those conversations have demonstrated, once again, the passion that people have for Wayne State and the willingness, in fact, eagerness, to be part of it. Our goal is to produce a plan that is a result of broad input focused on our unique opportunities and challenges adopted by the entire body of stakeholders and oriented towards results. Most of all, we want this plan to be a living, breathing document that organizes our priorities, but also can flex and adapt to new challenges and new opportunities. So we'll provide updates on the strategic plan as we go along, but all of you do have a role, and I encourage you to participate. And you can start by visiting wayne.edu forward slash strategic plan to offer your thoughts. Our capital campaign publicly launches on October 9th with a goal to raise $750 million by 2018, the university's 150th anniversary. Achieving our vision will require substantial resources. During this campaign, I wish to place much greater focus on our endowment. In comparison to our peer institutions, it is woefully low at about $300 million. Now, I recall a Detroit News article several weeks ago in which Michigan State University was discussed in relation to the other Big Ten schools. And a point was being made that they were challenged by in lagging its um, Big Ten peers because of its overall university endowment, its endowed scholarships, and endowed faculty were much lower. Michigan State's endowment, by the way, is $1.6 billion. Philanthropic dollars should not be about replacing declining state support or even substitute for tuition increases. It should be about for achieving grand visions that would not be possible without it, and for assuring that baseline support is available for the institution well past our tenure here. More immediate gratification might be attained by using philanthropic dollars in other ways, but increasing our endowment is the most beneficial long-term strategy for our university, and it is the responsible thing for us to do. I was just uh, speaking at a campaign event 
earlier this morning, during our, in which I remarked that the most important thing that we can do, the mo most important asset that will propel us to achieving our vision is the endowed faculty positions and endowed scholarships. So October 9th is just around the corner. And I urge you to participate in the campaign, both in the kickoff events and in your personal commitment. Wayne State is a special institution, as I know you feel the same way I do as, in terms of that. And so let's just make it a great one. Now, let's get back to the question I posed earlier. What is the spirit and soul of Wayne State? You've had some time to think about it. And if this was a type of event that invited open dialogue, I suspect that your responses will hit some common chords and that they will resonate with some of my own thoughts. Things like a gritty, hardworking, of the people, for the people kind of persona is certainly palpable. Wayne State historically opened its doors to students of all socioeconomic backgrounds, genders, ethnicities, and that holds steadfastly true to this day. So the sense of acceptance and inclusiveness is pervasive. Wayne State takes pride in being an integral part of the community, learning from but also contributing to its well-being. This community connectedness is part of the DNA of Wayne State. One tangible bit of evidence of this is being one of 14 institutions in the country to receive elite designation as an innovation economic prosperity university from its peers in the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Wayne State received this new distinction based on its support of innovation and influence on economic prosperity in Detroit and throughout Michigan. There are other qualities we can come up with that make Wayne State the special institution it is today. However, time is limited, so I want to comment on just one. And it's a value that I prize greatly, and one that I mentioned in my first address to the university almost a year ago. It's kind of there in the background, not often explicitly articulated here, but maybe just perhaps assumed. I see it, though, when alumni recount their Wayne State experience, when I speak to faculty about their work, when students describe to me why they chose Wayne State rather than another university. I see it in our student athletes as they compete in their respective sports, in our campus safety officers as they patrol the campus and neighborhood, and the keepers of our facilities and grounds. I see it in the staff and certainly in my own staff, people like Lori Scarborough and Kristen Copenhaver and Lisa Schrader, without whom I really don't know how I could function. So I have come to understand that the spirit and soul of Wayne State is deeply rooted in the pursuit of excellence. It's there, I see it, it's just below the surface, the foundation that undergirds everything we do. Our faculty are performing extraordinary work. Our athletic ranking is in the top 5% of the country among Division II institutions. We're increasingly attracting the very top high school students as the Honors College grew this past year in an unprecedented 56%. No need to keep it below the surface. Let's acknowledge and celebrate it. No excuses, no qualifiers, no apologies. As I've said before, we are what we are, we do what we do, and we will be second to none at what we do. In everything we do, we pursue excellence. We strive for preeminence. Now let's be clear, in pursuing excellence, I do not mean to imply that we are not already excellent. We are in many areas, not in all, but many. Nonetheless, it is the constant, relentless pursuit of excellence 
that is the foundation upon which we must build. So let's believe, let's pursue, let's achieve. We have work to do. Let's just roll up our sleeves, chart our own path of excellence, and let's just get it done. So I mentioned the extraordinary work of our faculty. So before I conclude, let me state that it's been my privilege to be a member of this distinguished faculty. For the first time in my career, I'm no longer seeing patients, but I still publish, still lecture in my academic discipline, and still mentor future academicians. My colleagues here in the Department of Ophthalmology and in the Division of Population Health Sciences, as well as colleagues nationally and globally, have provided opportunities for me to stay engaged in the academy, and I am grateful. Because of my engagement with academics, I interact with faculty throughout the country, and I will put our faculty up against that of any of our peer institutions. Again, it has been my privilege and honor to be associated with you, not only as president of this institution, but as a faculty member. And to the entire university, the staff, students, faculty, fellow administrators, the board of governors, as well as the broader community of which we are part, Jacqueline and I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to serve you. This is a watershed moment, yet the opportunities have never been greater for Wayne State University to reach its pinnacles of excellence, have never been greater for it to better position itself to better serve the community, both its geographic community as well as a community of higher education. Let me return to the metaphor of a tipping point for a moment. I believe the scale is tipping favorably, but we cannot rest. We must be relentless in our focus on the student experience, in increasing our graduation rate, in our discovery of and dissemination of new knowledge, in increasing our endowment, and always, always, always in the pursuit of excellence in everything we do.